So uh, we're going to try to get back to, to sky, using the Skyline a little bit. At this point, hopefully, you uh, from the tutorial you did on your own, you have this idea of that you you do some work to, to set some settings and build a library and and define what targets you're gonna you're gonna look for, and then you import some data into that. And we're gonna do that again. We're gonna do it with two uh, two data sets. One of them is the CelebSec yeast data set that Mike's been talking about, and the and the one we're gonna start with is this Bruder data set. They're both published in 2015, although I think you know they were they were collected considerably earlier than that. Takes us a while to to publish our work, obviously. Um, and uh, this was the this for me was the first time I saw this uh, this method of attack that uh, that you know Brian is now using for chromatogram libraries as well, uh, where you do some upfront uh, some sort of upfront preparation with pooled samples, uh, and then and then you do DIA to quantify. Um, so sort of separating like. And, and it went directly, did this direct comparison between this, this approach and MaxQuant, and, and, it was, and it was the first sort of, you know, DIA comparison to the old, the old thing that everybody had been doing for 10 to 20 years, or at least 10 years, 10, 15 years, uh, of extracting MS1 chromatograms from DDA data. So it sort of said, hey, we can, we can learn a bunch about our samples from pooled samples, and then we can go back and use DIA and, and other methods to, to query that on a really large scale. So that's so that was um, and then you know they had uh, this is this is one of the figures uh, where they show this like shotgun proteomics and HRM, which is DIA, um, and they're showing uh, peptide using identification instead of detection, but. <laughs> Peptides identified, and they, and they show this drop, this pretty you know staggering drop off with DDA. You know how many things were detected in every sample, or you know identified in every sample. The way DDA kind of like randomly samples stuff. If you if you have 24 samples, the likelihood, you know, the number of things that get identified in every sample is pretty is pretty low. Whereas with DIA, you know, once we have the retention time coordinates and and these expected uh, um, ion abundances, we we can we can detect the same thing over and over again pretty pretty well. Uh, and so then this is this is a uh, uh, this is another part of the same figure that I've seen presented a lot, and uh, it sort of shows the impact of this sort of uh, lack of repeated identification. Um, on a quantitative matrix. So again, this this would be this is going to be analytes down this way, and and then replicates down this way, and it's showing uh, how often we're missing, we're we're failing to identify peptides in our sample, and then how incredibly covered it is over here. But I think it kind of overstated the point because. Also in this, they say, well, they they took. MaxQuant and, and this DDA tool, and they said, well, we're not going to allow any feature alignment. So, so you can't do run-to-run -run feature alignment, and DIA can do that just fine because we use these IRTs, so we, so we have this prior knowledge of, of everything before we even start the experiment, whereas DDA relies on what it finds during the experiment. It, has no, it starts out with no prior knowledge, no, no retention time prior knowledge, and so it really relies very heavily on being able to do a, a cross-run alignment. And so I, I think this is a, if somebody shows you this and says, yeah, this proves that you know, what you get out of something like MaxQuant is garbage and you're gonna get this amazing thing out of DIA, I think it overstates the point. I think DIA is amazing, but, I, but, but there, there is this one key thing, this, no feature alignment was used. And so that means, so going back to a slide like I showed you the first day, and, and, I, and the more I look at this, the more, the more interesting I actually think this is. But uh, so, you know, we have IDs, one, two, three, and four in four of our samples, but we think we have peak areas for all nine. 
right? Because we use retention time alignment, we can see, well, those IDs would have been right over on top of this peak, you know, in all these other runs. So, of course, that's the same, same peak. And you can see that, wow, in the ones where we ID it, it's really intense. It's up to the, you know, it's up in the billions of, uh, of ions per second, you know, tens of billions of ions per second. And then down here, oh, it's, you know, a piddly, uh, you know, tens of, tens of millions of ions per second. And, but so, so again, this is like, wow, so the, the reason I'm looking at this is because my tool, my statistical tool said like, whoa, totally differentially regulated, you know, very different in between these samples and these samples. Um, can anybody see anything that, you know, just in the screen, I, I just been sitting back there and I looked at this slide and I went, huh. So uh, just of the screen full of information that Skyline is offering us, what, what, would, what do people look at? We talked about what to look at on the first day. So we've got these I dot P's, right? Those are, those are how well the measured isotope distribution actually conforms to what we expect. Is there anything wrong with the I dot P's? Not really. I mean, not 0 0.98, 1.0. I mean, so uh, maybe we expect that when we have that many ions and we're up in the billions, we expect really good I dot P's and maybe it falls off a little bit. So over here, anybody see anything? PPMs, yeah, it's like, wait, this is one, one to two, minus one to two PPMs pretty consistently. And this is where I'm getting all my identifications. I notice we have this is, must be a really fast mass spectrometer, right? Because we're getting, bam, we get we get a we. I mean, you know, this is a huge amount of signal, but only once do we get sort of an ID right in the middle where it was what we where I said that's where we would love to be getting them all the time. We get one here, and then dynamic exclusion kicks it off our list, and eventually we get one here. So why don't we get them in in, in these other runs? Do we think? You know, do we think we're not getting, it's just not intense enough and, 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 and the mass spectrometer is just going off and sampling other things? But, but we do notice, yeah, the PPM is different. Here, here's like up to 11. That's totally fine. I mean, we, we would definitely use extraction of maybe plus or minus 15 PPM. So, so we're not like seeing this chromatogram by accident, but it is quite a bit different from the two here. Uh, so the only other run where I see an ID is right here. And I actually see these two sort of resolve, these peaks resolving in chromatogram space. And now all of a sudden this one is, is the same PPM as this. And this other thing that is separated from is 11. So I think that in this case, this seven, nine, these things are actually a very nice interference. They're completely overlapped. And so there, there's something in here. I mean, it's still, uh, you know, it, it, this is, it's still differentially regulated, but I, but I, I think that there's a component of interference in here and, and that we don't, we're not actually, you know, if we, if we, if we went and looked at linear range, this would, this would cut off our, our, our dynamic range because we have we have interference here. I, I, that, that's that's my belief. Just looking at this, but anyway. So, uh, and the wonderful thing about uh, about DIA. So I just said, oh, this is this is overstating the point. But the wonderful thing about D DIA is we have lots of other options. You know, with with precursors, we're out of options. That's our only option. And if they overlap like that, we're you know, we have a hard time measuring them. But like as you've been seeing from Mike and Brian, it's like, oh, well, okay, maybe I want to separate these, these two phosphorylations. Oh, look, I can, I can find transitions in the middle that allow me to resolve these two things. So uh, both, both a word of caution on the interpretation and then, and then actually I was just putting together an example of like, look at, this is, this is what MaxQuant is doing and what every other tool that does MS1 is doing. And it's doing a fine job of picking really consistent. I mean, there's nothing else to pick here, but it just so happens that there's probably an interference. So, uh, 
So yeah, that key, key concept here, uh, which we maybe keep drilling into a lot, is this prior knowledge and consistency. These molecules behave the same way, treated the same way, on the sa especially on the same instruments, and especially with uh, respect to relative ion abundance, uh, which we store in spectral libraries, retention time, which for DIA we often store in IRT libraries, and these are powerful enough to be used cross-lab and cross-experiment, but, um, uh, and then, so that's why we, we measure, store, and reuse them, but they're even more powerful run-to-run. -run. So especially if we're same instruments, same chromatography. And that's, that's what, you know, Brian was, the, these on-column chromatogram libraries are, are based on, on more, the, the power of run-to-run -run consistency. And so this is, this is an example of one of the ways Skyline shows that to you, is this is 42 replicates, uh, the same peptide, and, and you get very, very consistent ion abundances. So you just get these nice stripes across here, and that, 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 makes you, that should make you feel pretty good that you don't have a lot of interference. This is, th these are the IRT peptides, so a subset of peptides that hopefully span your entire gradient. We want 10 to 20 of them. And that if we change, the, even if we change the gradient, what we showed in that paper was that they stay, they stay relative to each other. They stay, uh, you know, relatively spaced and everything else stays relatively spaced. But usually we're not doing this. We're not switching from, a, you know, a 30 minute gradient to a, to a 90 minute gradient. What we're doing is we're just seeing shifts in chromatography and we're trying to compensate for them. Uh, so that's defining an IRT scale. This is the... You know, this is now an IRT library filled in, so you can see the stars on all the the anchor peptides that tell that sort of tell us where you know where everything is relatively, and then and then we have all of our other peptides in the middle. So what we're going to do is we're going to get to building a much larger scale. So you did a very small scale thing. This this may make some of your laptops cringe, uh, but but I'm also I I, I can. I am able to remote desktop to my desktop, and, and we even have a server in the in the Macos lab that is really big, and I'm gonna show you how how easy it is to run on these big machines, and, and, and we'll play with the data a little bit, but I'm, it would definitely take too long for us to import like 40 runs or uh, you know 20, 25 runs. That these are these are bigger experiments, and we're gonna go after tens of thousands of peptides at a time. So you, you're gonna want a bigger machine for that. So uh, so in this case, we're saying, uh, so our prior knowledge, this is a, what I call the Skyline prior knowledge workflow, and, and we feed in a spectral library, just like the one you, you just built a spectral library with IRTs, and, and that's the normal Skyline workflow. Then we target pro product ions, do chromatogram extraction. We're going to use mProfit for peak picking, just like you did, but a bigger uh, a bigger set of peptides, and then we can do quantitative analysis. And in our case, we're going to end with our processing. We're going to end by exporting a report that Mina's going to pick up tomorrow and show you how to process in M MS stats. Um, but you can you can do the processing in Skyline, but in this course, we're going to focus on on MS stats, which is really the most sophisticated tool that you can use for that. And especially when you go big, I would say that you know like. MS stats can be really helpful. There's also this thing called an assay library. Who's heard of an assay library? Just one person. Okay. Well, so that that was a name that came out of the, the aerosol lab. And actually, when we did a joint paper with the aerosol lab, we said, ah, we're working with clinical people who are going to kill us if we call it an assay library because clinical people just do not consider this an assay library or you know an assay that there's a lot of validation that goes into building a clinical assay. So maybe assay libraries going out of out of style a little bit, but these are spectral libraries, and they combine uh, a bunch of choices about what's going. So it's it's in Skyline we have the target list, and we have the spectral library, and the, and and the spectral library could have all kinds of information that doesn't get used in the in the target list, and in this case everything gets distilled down into one one list. Uh, including the retention time information and the relative ion abundance. It's, if you've done SRM, it's kind of like a, a really, you know, a, a transition list on steroids with ex, extra, extra values. 
Uh, and all of these tool, these other tools accept these assay libraries as well. Um, yes. Peak shapes in the. Are you putting peak shapes in here? Are you storing peak shapes? So yeah, at this point, we, we don't, uh, and I'm interested in, in, in talking to you about how consistent peak shapes are over, over many runs, but um, yeah, I definitely, looking at the IRTs and some data, I found that some, that some of the diagnosis IRTs actually have tailing, which can cause problems creating deep libraries from DDA data. But, you know, I, I, I was unsure about how, whether that was the chromatography of that person or whether it was really consistent. So uh, at this point, we're not really using the, the, the acquired peak shape uh, as, as a score. Uh, there's there's a, a coalition peak shape matching. That's a, definitely a really important score uh, in, in M-Profit, where we that's what we end up doing, M-Profit peak picking. So anyway, so we have this concept of chromatogram library, which is basically just to use these two, whoops, these two things are using, are basically using DDA data to inform how we, how we, uh, how we query our DIA data. And this finally is, is uh, and it can be used in SRM and PRM too, but it's finally using actual targeted uh, data on the instrument uh, possibly on our exact same column as Brian's chromatogram libraries, uh, and 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 we, you can build targeted chromatogram libraries on Panorama. So those are, but you know, in the end, we're we, we're selecting a set of product ions to target uh, and doing chromatogram extraction. We're going to use mProfit, and so we're going to travel this workflow a little bit, uh, and we're and I guess. With the Bruder data set, we're going to start with one of these assay libraries because that that was uh, a paper done with Spectronaut, and they had they that they put an assay library in the paper, so that's what I started with. Uh, and with the CelebSec data set, they also had an assay library, but it was reading the paper, I felt it was so restrictive, and maybe the choices they made were were not the right ones. I, I didn't totally agree with the choices that were made. And, and so I decided to build my own. So, so that so we're going to look at both of these. Uh, we're going to start with Bruder. All right. So, I'm actually so before I'm going to get you working, but before I do, I'm going to kick off uh, some command line processing in Skyline. It's possible to use Skyline for command line processing, uh, and in the newest versions. So if I bring up Skyline Daily, uh, there's actually full documentation on the command line inside Skyline. Once it comes up. Um, and I'm going to, because it takes a while to, to do the command line processing, I'm going to, I'm going to kick that off and then I'm going to show you how we came up with the document. So here in uh, help documentation. There's now command line help. Uh, so you can run Skyline at the command line. And I've created some, you know, so this is like you can do, you can do, you can open a file, save a file, output it to a new location. Uh, and then there's all kinds of processing that you can do on the command line. And if we go to Uh, you should all have this uh, DIA pub, which is we're going to enter this DIA pub, and that's where we have Bruder 2015 and CelebSec 2015. Um, and in here, we have, can everybody see that okay? Uh, so in here, we have a, a dot sky and a dot skid and a sky.view. So this is like a fully processed file with all the data imported into it. You can see that there, 
fairly big. These are like six, this, the, the skid file, which contains all the chromatograms is six gigabytes here. Um, and, but there's all, and then there's this Bruder template file, which can be used with these scripts. And the scripts, I have uh, an msstats report plus dot skyr and a multi analysis dot bat and a, a peaks area. The skyr files are reports. And so I have multi analysis dot bat. So I'm going to kick these off on the template. So I, I've, and then we're going to come back and make our own template. So what we're going to do together is we're going to, to start, is we're going to make the template which would allow us to, to process this data, you know, to target things in these mass spec runs, in, in these mass spec runs or any mass spec runs like them. Uh, so it's basically all of, all of the parameters and uh, uh, captured in one place is one of these. Um, and actually, let's open that. So everybody can go to their skyline right now. If you have something open, I do. Uh, you can go ahead and make sure it's saved. Uh, so I'm still at. I'm still at this morning. Um, and so those those zip files. So there's. I was showing you this this Bruder template dot sky dot zip, and if you look inside it, it's got just a dot sky file. Who knows what a dot sky dot view is? Yeah, it shows it, it, it stores where your windows are. It shows it stores the ex, all how the the tree is expanded, what your selection is, but it's all, but you could delete it. It wouldn't. It would not. It would not kill you. It's the one file that that really you could delete, and and all that would happen is you'd you'd lose a lot of state, uh, but you wouldn't you wouldn't really lose a huge amount of work. Uh, okay, so so let's go and file open that, uh, and if we go to documents, di pub, Bruder, and we open this Bruder template. Uh, first, it unzips it, and then it and then it loads it. And there's a lot of peptides in here, so it, so even just lo loading the template takes a little bit of time. And there we are. So now you can see that it's got. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's got 3,867 proteins and uh, 348,000 transitions. So it's going to extract quite a lot of chromatograms. Um, you can see that we've got the IRTs right up at the top. Those are the diagnosis IRTs. And way down at the bottom, there are decoys. And there's there's a lot of decoys, so don't ex expand that. Um, so anyway, so that's a fully fully created template, and now we could go and we could import data, we could change parameters, we could play with that. Uh, this is just a full set of settings uh, and targets. But we're gonna we're gonna build our own in a moment. So let's just close that down. And now what I'm gonna do is switch to these two remote computers that are bigger than what I have here. And this, uh, well, let's do, let's do, this is my, my old dev machine. So yeah, I guess last time people asked, what should, you know, what should I be, what should I use for one of these experiments? Uh, and so, well, I'll show you what I have here. So this is a, uh, an, an i7, uh, 4790. So uh, an i7, most modern computers are i7s of some generation. I'm not sure which generation this one is, uh, but you can see it's going about 3.6 gigahertz and it's got eight logical processors. So that's a quad core and quad core has been like the standard for, I don't know, 10 years now. Uh, and, uh, and then you can also see that it's got about, it's got 16 gigabytes of RAM. 
So if you're, I would say this is sort of the minimum. You could probably get this for under under $1,000 now. Uh, this is the minimum. Um, yeah, you might be thinking about like a, something that would be termed a workstation or a gaming computer, something pretty fast. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't, if I'm going to do sort of proteome wide things, I wouldn't go smaller than a 16 gigabyte computer, uh, of a 16 gigabyte RAM. And then I would want one of these quad cores, uh, preferably up in the 3.5 to 3.7 gigahertz range. So, and then it, it turns out that um, my rule of thumb for buying computers, uh, I've been in the computer industry for like 30 years, and it seems that spending about two grand on a computer is, is you know, what, what Microsoft did for me in the 90s and what Mike is still willing to do for me. <laughs> in the, and, and, that, and that's still a great computer. You can see that this, this XPS tower, I think, is a pretty nice computer as a workstation. Uh, you can get in on it, and this is this is easily as good as the one I just showed you. Uh, it's, it's better than the one I just showed you, and it's it's about twelve hundred dollars. Uh, no, I'm not selling. I'm not actually a, a Dell salesman, uh, but uh, you see, you could use something comparable from another, and then. I now, the one I just bought, I, I, I went for 64 gigabytes of RAM because that just gives me a whole lot more headroom. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't have to, I don't nearly have to worry about as running out of memory as much with that. Uh, I also like SSDs. So this is like a one terabyte hard drive. I might consider getting a 500 gigabyte SSD and, and a you know two to four terabyte hard drive and in this case that puts me up to two thousand um, dollars so but and you'll notice that this is a, this is a six core so the one I just showed you had a quad core now if you get a modern i7 this is what is this i7 uh, eighth generation so now you get hex core so anyway so these are the kinds of computers that I would be doing these large experiments with. I'm not really, you know, if you send something to the support board and says, wow, you know, I'm trying to load all this data on my laptop, I'm going to just say, well, you know, you should probably be using a faster computer. Uh, so try to try to get a desktop for this kind of experiment, I would say. Um, so anyway, so here's my desktop and I have, I have set up the data set here. So here's the data set. And this has got more data than you have on your on your hard drive right now. So I couldn't put everything for this. Like there was just no way that I mean, somebody already complained to me about being able to load 64 gig onto their laptop. So so this has like all the DDA data. So here we have all the raw files. There's uh, I guess, yeah, so 32 minus two. So there's about 30 raw files that make up the DDA experiment. And then actually max, the max quant data is not here, the max quant search, and this is the fast A file. I'm gonna show you the actual results of the max quant search and show you that we could build our own library from it. Uh, these are the raw data, these are the DIA raw data files and there's uh, 24 of those, and you can see that there's there's a run here that I did earlier to time this all and make sure it worked. So this is actually a sky and skid file. That's a full run of this data already. Um, and then I've got these scripts. What's in the library folder? Oh yeah, okay. So we're gonna look at the library folder in a moment. Uh, so. And then I've got these scripts that I wrote, and and you are more than welcome to grab. I like anytime I work on a B big DIA project, I pretty much port these scripts to run on it. So I so I highly recommend them uh, as extremely useful scripts. They basically can do a processing in Skyline and then run some R scripts. And I have two R scripts here, which are or one R script here, which is called detection.r that I wrote but you could just as easily be running MS stats. So if we look at multi-analysis.bat, this is a, how many people actually run batch files? 
Oh, so you guys are mostly gooey people? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, you can do things from the GUI as well, and, that, and you know, that's the nice thing about Skyline, but, but uh, you can really improve, you know, if you get somebody in your lab to help, up, help you set up some of these batch scripts, you, uh, you can do things way faster. So here, all that I'm changing is I have to tell Skyline, or I have to tell the script where to find the R, where to find R, which I installed on this computer. I have to tell it where to find the what's called the Skyline CMD exe. So that's a little exe that sits next to Skyline that I can run uh, as a command line. And then I had to tell it where my root data folder is. And that's going to change from machine to machine. And then this call, this line right here, is just a call to another script that says, "Hey, look for the raw data in the raw in the raw folder. Create a process folder called this, and use this bruder.sky file. That's the template file. And so now, if I go here, I can uh, I can type scripts." Uh, and and I just run this multi-analysis.bat, and I called it multi-analysis.bat because I showed you some graphs where I had checked like uh, isolation windows and retention times. I had changed those, and I created these graphs of how many how many things I was able to detect, and they changed. So this is I would just go to sleep at night and run you know 20 analyses in 20 different ways uh, overnight, and and I could do the same here today. But I'm just going to run the one. And while that's running, you can see it's not really giving me much information here. But if I go to the folder again, uh, now I've got this import.log. There was another import.log for the last run that's been renamed with a date stamp on it. And if I open this up, then I can see that Skyline has already opened the file and saved it to a new location, reopened it, and now it's it's already started to import the raw data files. So this is, you know, uh, especially if you're going to try multiple things, I got really tired of pushing the UI through everything I wanted to do. And so I could use these batch files to just process way, way more data. Uh, and now we can have a look at what's happening to the computer. You can see that the memory is starting to be consumed. But yeah, so it, and it's and it's definitely starting. The CPU utilization is at, at 30, 40 percent, uh, and um, and yeah, the memory use is going up, and it's really hitting the disk. So that's it's it's pulling the data out of the raw files. So it's it's on disk D. It's it seems to be bottlenecked on disk access. Um, so one last thing, we should look at. Sometimes I have this setting out in the multi analysis .bat. Oh, that's telling me the log file has been updated. Uh, but in this case, I left it inside this other script, which is called skyline analysis.bat. So there's two two batch two batch files. Uh, and here you can see that I'm telling Skyline to use four processes. So it's using four parallel processes, and you can see that in the log file as well. Uh, you can see that it's got one, two, three, four here. And right now, if it's about 40% of the way through those first four files. So that is going to take a while. So we'll just leave it running. We don't have to mind it or anything. And it's going to go through in the entire full processing. And then it's going to run R and create some reports for us. And then just to see the difference between that and uh, what a bigger computer is like, Here is this other computer where it's got it's got 48 logical processors, um, and but you can see that they're running at 2.5 gigahertz. So if I actually just import four files at a time, this is going to be slower. I mean, lots of people could do it all at once, but for me individually, 
the clock speed on this computer is slower on each on each thing so i'm not really and oh you can also see that it's got like 192 gig it's got tons of memory so there's no no worry about running out of memory so we're going to run a bunch of different processes at the same time here is my multi-analysis.bat for this computer you can see that the data lives in a different place my Skyline CMDXE lives in a different place. I'm using a different version of R and my R RXE is in a different place. Um, and then if I open up, go into scripts and open up this Skyline analysis.bat, you can see that I'm gonna do 12 processes at a time. And, and when you choose how many, it's a good idea to think about how many processors you have as well as how many files, right? Because if I did 11 at a time, it would still take me three cycles. Where if I do 12, because I got 24 files to import, if I do 12, I can do it in two shots. And that will be faster than 11, at a, like quite a bit faster than doing 11 at a time. So let's go ahead and start that out. You can actually see the result of my last run. So it takes about 20 minutes to process everything uh, on this computer. It's going to take about 50 minutes on my uh, so we start out multi-analysis.bat, and that's going to go ahead and create one of those log files for us. So here I have my import log, and it's just getting going here. And so it's now, it's opened it and saved a copy. To, the, to this special processing directory. Now it's decided that it's going to import those 24 raw files. Let me show you this. So inside the raw folder, I now have this assay lib 6 ppm. And this, so this is the thing that's, and you can see a lot of temp files uh, and these XIC files. So, so Skyline is working hard there. And now if I look at the log file, on this computer, you can see that I'm doing 12 at a time and I'm 20% through them. So I'm not going to teach you how to do all this, but you all have a flash drive with, the, with these scripts on them and you can totally customize them to, to do what I'm doing. Uh, I actually have a flash drive here that has all the raw data. So if you do have a lot of disk space on, your, on, on something that you brought with you, I can give you raw data and you can run this exact process on your, on your computer. And so we'll come back to this. So now let's get going with, uh, so if everybody can bring up Skyline. So we're gonna now try to, we just pretend, hey, we just read that cool Bruder paper uh, and we wanna analyze the data, which is where I started. Um, so I'm actually going to, let's go to view audit log. I've never done, I've never done it for this experiment before. Uh, you can see that audit log is telling me quite a lot of stuff because, uh, I've got like, it's starting with the settings that I was using before. Um, and so it's telling me, wow, you started with a document that has all these settings, and I don't really want all those settings, so I'm going to go back to settings default. So the audit log is, oh, I don't want to save that, sorry. Uh, settings default, and no, I don't want to save my current settings. Uh, and so now Skyline says, wow, you just like changed all these settings, which are the settings I just started with from the default. So I want to, I think if I click new, New, no, oh. yeah, this is this is a bug. Okay, well, we, we won't worry about that. Let's go, let's make sure that we're on default settings. Yes, there, there, oh no, yeah, default settings, no. So this is a bug that I fixed. Uh, unfortunately, we have all this extra audit log stuff at the beginning, but we won't worry about that for now. Um, okay, so hopefully I'm just working on a paper with Mina where, where we process all this data and then she's like, okay, write a description of everything you did. 
and I and it's now been five years since we started this, and and I'm and I'm struggling, and and we think that these audit logs are going to be you know really really helpful for everybody uh, who uses Skyline because yeah you can do a lot of things, uh, and and we think it, it maybe. <laughs> Maybe one day it'll be helpful for us when you come and say, you know, everybody else seems to be doing fine on the tutorial, but I get this. And we'll be like, oh yeah, you went wrong. You know, you, you missed this one step because we could look at the audit log. Uh, all right, so what we're gonna do to our, from the default settings, the first thing we're gonna do is choose integrate all, which is less important than it used to be, but I, I, I still, I'm gonna start with that. Uh, Integrate all, whether or not you had integrate all checked, used to impact your quantitative results. It no longer does. So, so it used to be that if you had any, if you didn't have integrate all on Skyline, could choose which which transitions it would include in the integration, uh, and that that tended to be add more variance to your data. So, but we but in 4.2 we fix that so that integrate all is just a display thing. But we'll still turn it on. Uh, and now we're going to go to peptide settings. And we are going to, I have, OK, well, anyway. Uh, we're going to uh, say that we're going to allow two miscleavages. Uh, and then we won't worry about a background proteome for this one. Uh, and then we're not going to worry about a pr prediction either. We don't have any, we're going to get the prediction from our assay library. Uh, so, so again, we're going to use this prepackaged assay library given to us by the authors of the Bruder paper. Uh, now, when you import an assay library, these settings don't really matter. Skyline will just import whatever is in there. So it's not going to do any length filtering, but I decided that I would go ahead and put in um, 6 and 55, which is really, that's, they allowed peptides of six amino acids, which I think is, a, I, you know, I think some of these things, when you look at the papers, uh, if you look at them long enough, you start to maybe feel that that they made some choices in order to get the list to be as big as possible because they were trying to win over people who are going to look at DDA and go like, oh, but your list is smaller. So uh, I'm not sure that, you know, it's really that I would recommend targeting length 6 to length 55. Uh, and, you know, every single peptide possible. Uh, but that's what happened here. Um, and then we don't, we don't have a, um, a library that's going to come from our assay library, but we do want to, I'm going to go ahead and reset my list, uh, cause probably not everybody has those. So if I start with carbidomethyl cysteine, did every, I assume not everybody had all those modifications that I put in, right? Okay. So let's, let's add them. So if you click here and then type OXI and down arrow, then you get oxidation HW and one more down arrow and you get oxidation M. So that's just, if you type a prefix, Skyline will sort of jump into this list of predefined modifications to where your prefix was. So that's a variable modification, oxidation M. Everybody got that? Anybody, is there anybody who needs more time is not with me? Okay, so feel free to go, ah, you know, hey, wait. Uh, and then we're going to have to add a, some more. The other one we're adding is you can type ACE. And then if you click this down arrow, you see that Skyline jumps to acetyl K or N term, and we'll take the N terminal one and click OK. And then it turns out that this paper also was pretty, was, well, not the most permissive I've seen, but pretty permissive about, about uh, using neutral loss ions, which I, you know, uh, if you look at the pan-human library, they don't use any neutral loss ions. So, so there was, I think when we started out, there was a lot of, a lot of assay libraries contained a lot of neutral losses. 
uh, and now and and there seems to be a trend away from that. But this this one still did, and so to get Skyline to understand those mass to charge ratios, we go down to the bottom here where there's water loss, and click OK, and then add also up at the top. There should be this ammonia loss, KNQR. So it turns out that these losses really only happen on certain peptide and certain amino acids. So that was another thing. Early on, people were allowing neutral losses, water and ammonia, like ha could happen anywhere. Any fragment could have a water, or and and so I, I got a, an early. I think an early version of the Pan-Human Library, maybe, and I and I and I said, uh, Ben, these aren't even possible. Some of these things, and and uh, and he listened, and I, I don't think actually the Pan-Human Library uses neutral losses now. But. So let's click OK, um, and then yeah, I guess just check them all. Um, and I guess to invoke, to, you don't really, you can just leave this because we're not going to add anything heavy, so it won't be a problem. But somebody had a problem where they they had light for their internal standard type, and that really messes Skyline up if you're doing a label-free experiment. So since this is label-free, we'll go ahead and click none. So there is no standard in here, no matter what the label, what happens with labeling. And click OK. So we're not doing anything with quantification. If you were here for session one, quant this is like calibrated quantification. It's not, not, you know, we're not doing any calibration here. All right. And you can see that Skyline is putting the new information at the top of this log as I go. So it shows all the, all the things I just did to the pe peptide settings right there. Um, and then now I'm going to go to settings, transition settings. And usually when I'm starting with, uh, when I'm doing some kind of full scan extraction, so full scan extraction would be, would be DDA with MS1 extraction, DIA or PRM. And SRM, if I'm doing SRM, I just leave it like this. I don't touch, touch it, but... For DIA, in this case, we're just going to do product ion filtering DIA, but more recently, we would be interested in doing precursor ions too. We found that that can be really beneficial, especially in differentiating things like those, uh, um, those oxidized methionines, right? So we, we've seen that you know if you don't have enough isolation and you get the two things, it's really hard to tell just from the product ions where what's an oxidized methionine and what's not, uh, but they differ quite a bit in the precursor. So if you include the precursor, you have some hope of differentiating them. And so, and, and we found that actually including the precursor makes us do a little bit better at detection. We get a higher detection numbers. Um, so there's pretty good reason to add this, but, we're, but this experiment didn't. Uh, and so we're gonna leave that alone. It's also totally possible to do it without it, but then you do have this risk of, of misidentifying things that are modified. So we'll go ahead and pick DIA. We're going to leave the default. This is Orbitrap data, so centroided with 10 ppm mass accuracy is a pretty good choice for this instrument. And now we have to do, uh, we want to do an isolation scheme. So go ahead and add an isolation scheme. Everybody with me? Okay, whoops, that's not gonna work. Uh, add an isolation scheme. Um, and we're gonna go ahead with pre-specified windows again, just so that we can get a look at the windows. Cause I put, I put one raw data file on this, on this machine so that we could, we could see what the, what the isolation scheme was. So go ahead and click import. So you could also go read the paper and it's defined in there but it's also inside the raw data file. So if we just, so if you click import and then you're in Brewer 2015 and you go into this raw one, there is one raw data file from this experiment, this 24 raw data file experiment. And I can click open on that. 
and Skyline pretty quickly can, can get me the isolation scheme. So who can tell me about the isolation scheme? Well, yeah, so you maybe you click the import <laughs> or you click graph. Uh, if you click graph, we're going to get a bunch of information about it. And, and you can see by this curvature that it's variable. Um, it's not as easy to, it's, if I'm looking at the list, I can more easily see that it sort of starts with 30 MZ windows. So 400 to 30, and then 428 to 459. So it kind of starts with 30 and gets wider all the way down to the bottom where we're doing like 250 MZ in one window, right? And we have some overlap. What kind of overlap do we have? Do we have two cycle overlap that will allow us to do demultiplexing the way? No, we don't have that. Because uh, because what what did what did Mike and and uh, Brian say about uh, about the demultiplexing overlapping? Can you can you use variable windows and demultiplexing at the same time? No. Can you use so these little sort of uh, pinkish things are our margins. So you can see there's this one MZ overlap. This is what the mass spectrometer actually measured. And if you and if you uncheck margins, those will disappear and Scan will say, oh, these are the extraction windows. So even though the quadrupole measured that, you know, it it, it funneled all the precursors from that range into the collision cell and and and, and broke them up and, and fragmented them together, we're we're gonna only extract chromatograms from things that fall within the blue range. So this is really just to avoid the, the quadrupole, uh, the decline in signal at the edges of the quadrupole. And that's something that was in the original, oh, the original open SWAT or the SWAT paper. Yes, yeah, SWAT. But anyway, so there's, there's our isolation scheme. Lots less error prone to import it than to try to type it in yourself or try to pull it out. I mean, the original, the first time I did this, I pulled it out of the, there's like a spreadsheet or a table in, in the manuscript and I, and I pasted it in here, uh, but this is a lot less error prone. So we're gonna call this, uh, we'll just call this the Bruder 2015 uh, Thermo, uh, VW for variable window. Okay. So that's what it is. It's a thermo method. They were using a Q exactive. Uh, so click OK. Um, and we're going to use retention time predictions. So we're not going to do this based on MSMS IDs. We're going to use retention time prediction to make sure we get our most accurate. Uh, uh, prediction, but we have to, the IRTs are going to come from that assay library. So, okay, on the instrument, we're going to say uh, our minimum MZ is going to be 300 to 1800, and this, uh, this now only applies to the fragment islands, because what we're allowing for precursor ions is defined by this by this method, right? Which goes what what's the range of this method? Four hundred to twelve hundred, right? So yeah, that's important to, to have in mind. You know, we've been talking about four hundred to eight hundred, four hundred to nine hundred for you. So four hundred. A lot of people seem to like four hundred as a as a minimum, but the, but how far up people go varies quite a bit. So. Uh, but let's go ahead and okay. So we're back to instrument. Why would we want what's why would we use 300 for a minimum MZ for the fragment ions? Can the mass spectrometer measure that lower than that? Probably. Yeah. What? What? Yeah, that, that'll get rid of our B1s, B2s. So, so previously, what we've done is uh, we've solved this problem. Uh, so let's, so we 300 to 1800, let's go to the filter tab. And previously we did, uh, 
we did ion three to last ion. Um, and now we're just, we, we'll go ahead and do ion one to last ion. So anything goes, but it's gotta be within that precursor. It's gotta be within that. It's gotta be bigger than 300, which is gonna get rid of two amino acid fragments. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn this off again. I'll go ahead and allow use DIA exclusion, although this isn't really gonna be a big deal. And now we're gonna enter all of the things that I found in this assay library, which are two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So again, I mean, well, these are things that were identified by Max Quant, right? So it starts with a DDA run. I don't know, you know, are they going to be fragmented well? Are they going to, you know, are they going to match the DDA spectra from, from Max Quant? Probably not, right? We get, we either get ramped collision energy or one collision energy, and we're probably tuning it for charge two. And so, but, you know, let, this was, you know, again, this is why I think sometimes people are just trying to get their numbers. So what, what ion charges are you willing to, to, to allow? How about one, two, three, four, five, and six? And then, of course, Y and B and P. So this is a, this is a precursor, probably a precursor with a loss or something, I don't know. It's, yeah, maybe a precursor with water loss, but these, these are all the things that I found in, in the file. They were very permissive. <laughs> uh, here, Skyline will search for precursor in the MS2. Uh, yes, because we, only, it will search for precursor in the MO, MS2 because we, we did not turn on MS1 filtering. So now it's going to search for precursors in the MS2, and it will always search for precursors with losses. So, so, and we and we did an oxidation which has a loss, and we've allowed water loss, and 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 so it's always going to allow your precursor with losses. Uh, if you if you're doing MS1 extraction, we just we don't we don't do precursors in the in the thing. All right, so. Uh, Okay, the last thing we want to do here is um, to tell Skyline that we want um, how many how many product ions we want from our library. Actually, I think we can. Well, it doesn't say. I, I guess because we think this is Orbitrap data, let's go ahead with a match tolerance of 0.05. Um, I hope that works. Uh, and um, we can do, um, let's say we're going to allow uh, so we're really going to get as many as as uh, as the assay library gives us, but we'll allow 10 and then we're going to have a minimum of six product ions. And not all of this is going to be respected because we're importing the assay library. But that's that's all we need. So, yeah, okay. What? I don't need to because I haven't defined any filters. <laughs> like I'm one I'm one to to last ion and I'm and I didn't do anything. Oh, except for except for this. Uh I'm just still going to leave it because, <laughs> because I don't, again, I don't know what they put in the assay library. And if I, if I put filters in, it's just going to kind of conflict with the assay library. So, and then prediction is just monoisotopic and these, and these four parameters are all about uh, SRM. So, so we leave them on none. Okay. Click. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, yeah, we got a bunch more changes. You know, Sky, Skyline's tracking everything we do. Um, we got the whole isolation window put in here, um, or the, the pre-specified isolation windows. All right, so now let's go ahead and import the assay library. So go file, import, assay library. 
So I, we used to consider this a transition list, but because it became popular enough with the other tools, we, we, we made it so that you can now refer to it as an assay library. If you refer to it as a transition list, that will work too, but an assay library, the th an assay library looks almost exactly like what we would do for a transition list for SRM. It has two editions. What are the two editions? IRT and what? Well, it could have decoys. In this case, there are not, we didn't include the decoys. Relative intensities. So those are two things that it's like, oh, wow, we can find things way better if we have an idea of where they show up and an idea of how they fragment. So let's go back up to Bruder 2015 and into this library folder. And here is the, this is the, the CSV that you can download from the manuscript, MCPM, you know, that. <laughs> and, and then there's also a Biognosis IRT CSV, which we're gonna use in a second, but we'll start with the main assay library and click open. Tells us we have to save. So click okay. And we're going to save up in this root folder, Bruder 2015, and we'll call it uh, to Bruder Tutorial, and click Save. And that gets Skyline started, doesn't it? <laughs> There it goes. So now it's importing the assay library. Uh, first, it, it just inspects all the peptide sequence information to try to figure out the modifications that it needs. And, and mine's going now. Okay, so while it's going, that's gonna take a little bit. We can go check on the other computers. My desktop. Brendan X UW5 is probably still working. You can see the audit log says, do I wanna update? And I say, yes. And so on that computer, I am, wow, I'm on, I'm on file 21. So I'm pretty far through, which means we've already, we, we've, been, we've been away for a while. Uh, so you can see it's doing four at a time and then it's changing over. If I, if I press F5, you can see now it's, this is the, its last set of files, right? So it's gotten all the way through 20 files and it's doing 21 through 24 and, and now it's about 20% through. So that's what's going on on my desktop. And meanwhile, if I go look at my laptop, still importing. Anybody done importing? Yeah, you're somebody unfinished? Oh, you have like some kind of like gaming laptop or something. Yeah, she's looking pretty proud of herself. <laughs> okay, yeah. An assay library? You can actually, and there's the, uh, uh, Biognosis offers uh, a report that allows you to, cause, because Skyline ha actually, the, the, the library builder in Skyline is the most flexible library builder known to the field. So, so if you want to build a library, even even diagnosis, it, like you want to build a library from something they can't handle, like peaks or I, I don't know what they can't handle, but they go, oh, go build it on Skyline and then export it into an assay library and they'll give you a report to do that. So, uh, oh, mine's done. Did it, is anybody else done? Oh, people are done. And they're, you're sitting here looking at this error. This is, wow, 329, right? Is there anybody else who still needs time to get to this error? Okay, well, I'll start, I'll start talking about the error. Uh, wow, what is... Yeah, why indeed? Is this really the same... That is really weird. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I'm confused because I have Skyline Daily running too. I don't know. What? Does everybody have the Skyline Daily icon? Wow, 
Okay. I oh, it must be like saved inside the document or the dialogue. So yeah. So frequently, what we do is so you can use the the visual. So it is a little bit a digression into developer world. You can use the designer and you can assign an icon. And if you assign an icon, then it stores this blob that is your icon inside the document. So most of the time, we have one line at the beginning of the bringing up the form that says, you know, form.icon equals this. And we point it to the same one that's in the main window. But this, that, so that's a really little bug uh, that I'm going to, I'll fix after this. Um, okay, so if we look down at these errors, the first one, Ah, I don't know. This is like precursor does not match. Oh, I know what that is. Yeah. So precursor 689 does not match, and the closest possible match is 681. And then you can see that the, that it, it's a it's a peptide that starts with an M. So why would a I'll give you a hint doubly charged peptide containing an M be eight uh 8MZ off where it's supposed to be. Oxidation, right? So it's actually oxidized, and for some reason, they, they things got messed up. So, uh, so yeah. So they're say they're saying that it's heavy, it's oxidized, but they didn't put any specification in to tell us it's oxidized. And so we go like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. That's a that's an unoxidized methionine. Um, next one. Precursor 400 is, da, 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 is outside the range covered by the DIA isolation scheme. So that's just a mistake somebody made, uh, right? Yeah, it's, it's in the margin. So they, they actually did you know, 400 to 1,200 instead of 401 to 1,200. And what, you know, or I don't know, 12, or, you know, 11.99 or something. Uh, so, so they're allowing peptides in the leftmost margin. And so we could go correct that, or we could go tell Skyline, ah, it's okay, we're going to let things happen in the left margin. How would we do that? I'm not going to do it because it took so long for everybody to get to this error. <laughs> that, that, but you could just go back to settings, go back to your isolation scheme, and set your window one over. And then Skyline will go, okay, well, you want to, ex sure, I, I'll extract that for you. Uh, even though it, we wouldn't, you know, by the design of our experiment, we should have rejected. So the easy way to reject all of these things, which all, I, I promise you, amount to either things that are, are less than 400 or things that have a, an oxidized methionine, a lot of them. And then there's also, uh, um, there's like acetylation on, on, on things too. So anyway, so they, they end up just being confusion over modifications and, and really 300 transitions. When you see how many transitions there are, losing a few is just not going to hurt. So click OK. And now Skyline says, well, where can I find your IRT peptides? Right? Because I can tell this is an assay library. It's got, it's got IRTs in it. Where can I find the peptides? And sometimes they're in a protein, right? And I could, so I could just pick a protein that I put in here. Uh, and Skyline, if you had a protein in here that had any of the known IRTs, Skyline would just sort it right up to the top and say, you probably want this one. But we did, this assay library does not include the IRTs, so we have to say separate transition list. And that's where we, and then we click browse. And then we go back into this library folder and choose Biognosis IRT. And that's just the IRT definition uh, with probably with, uh, with library intensities as well. So click OK. I think last time you actually used two different libraries to get these all into your document in the, in the, in the tutorial, right? Well, in this, in this case, if you import everything this way, well, with an assay library, um, then you then you can get them. So click OK. And so now it's adding IRT values for the imported peptides. And now it's uh, it's creating the spectral library. 
So that's going to take some time. So let's go back to looking. <laughs> Uh, is everybody started on that? Is everybody through there? Okay, so if we go back to looking at my big fast machine, actually even my own desktop might be done by now, but if we go back to looking at the big fast machine, we want to see how it's been doing. Uh, it should be long done. So yeah, so it was done 20 minutes. It was done at... Uh, 13 so yeah this is on the east coast so it was done at 427 and and that was a while ago and so you can see that it did everything um it did all the imports and then it joined all the imports together uh and then it created a scoring model and did the calculations of the scoring model training and then it spits out this is what the scoring model is so who can tell me what the most valuable, who can tell me what the most valuable uh, scores are to this model? Yeah. yeah, the shape, the weighted shape is the most important, right? It's 40%. You can just look at these percentages. Coalition count is actually a score that was never in uh, open swath it was it was actually the the original score that skyline used it didn't do too well it did really well with srm data but it didn't do too well when we got to swath but it's still a very powerful score usually gets pretty good and then the library dot plot product itself the weighted shape is how well the 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 co the, the ions coalute so how, how well the, the shapes match each other. It's similar to, to the, what Brian does something sort of like the weighted shape that, you know, where he, he showed you that he, he calculates an expected shape and then looks at how well everything compares to that. Coalition, yeah, that's just how well the apexes line up. So, so some of these were in the original, in, in the original manuscript. Uh, and some of them weren't. So retention time difference, obviously, we had squared. I'm not sure I like squared. It doesn't seem to be having much impact here anyway. Uh, and then, yeah, coalition was in the in the S, in the M profit. Uh, signal to noise is something that uh, that Hannes added to open swath. And then product mass error is something also, but they're they're not super powerful scores. Okay, and so then, once the model was built, we readjusted the peak boundaries, saved the file, uh, and then we wrote out a report, which is 20, 29,000 uh, rows long. And then we started running R scripts. So this is all output from R scripts. And it, it's useful to me. So let's go see the product of the R scripts. So this all happened while we were away just doing something else. So that's the nice thing about this. Uh, if we, yeah, so if we go into this folder, you can see here's the sky file that we built. And you can see that there's a, there's a CSV file. That's the exported report. There's some other, uh, there's another CSV file, which is another exported report. And then there's some, actually this one, this is exported by R, these are exported by R, and then there's this nice PDF file, which tells us something about the search. So I just, I did the, I created this PDF file when I was working with that massive data set that Rudy was talking about that Ben, ben Collins collected. It was like 250 runs from 12 different labs and he showed, and, and I created these, these plots. These are just, R is generating these plots. So this is, if, how many people took a course and learned some R this week? Right, so if you can do that, now you can have a really simple batch file outside that you can run processing with Skyline and then you can run R scripts that will plot things and, and give you information. And it's super, how many people feel they now can write an R script that would output a PDF like this? Yeah, like that's a great, I, I love that, man. <laughs> like I started playing with this and, and it was, yeah, it made me feel so powerful to be able to generate these plots. And then some of these plots have now made it made it into Skyline. So we're like, oh, well, that's really useful. This one hasn't, 
But so what? So what is this telling us? This is telling us uh, how many things get detected in every run. It's really pretty consistent. Uh, it tells us um, the total level of uh, of things that were in at least twelve runs. So at least half the runs is more is more than I'm detecting in any single run, right? And this is this is the cumulative total. And so maybe if you're listening really closely from Rudy, you're happy that it doesn't go up like this because that means that. So if it, if it goes up a little bit and levels off, that means that we're basically detecting the same thing over and over and over again and not like adding a whole lot of error. And then this is an expression of, this is all the things that, have, so this is what's been detected in all of the runs. And right about here is where it's been detected in about in, in 12. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> And then this is with less than 20% CV. And then it turned out that if I did some normalization, that goes up. So if I did me and normalization, my, my CVs got better. So that's, and well, that also, and that also tells us that most of the things we're measuring are background and they're not changing. So this is a spike in experiment, but, but most of it is just background. So, and then this, this is, how many runs things are detected in. So most things are detected in all runs, and we have a little bit of drop off, and we're happy that we don't have, like this actually is a little bit higher than there. So, so that, this tells us really about false discoveries, because if there's a big thing here, that means I'm getting a lot of false discoveries, because there's a lot of things detected in just one run. And then here we can actually see a CV distribution and then here we can see a two-dimensional CV distribution where we see that there's this classic curvature when we get to lower intensities. So all this is just like, I didn't have to do any, and you can, you can create plots like this out of your data too and run everything in the command line and then go to bed and wake up in the morning and look at it all. So, uh, and the bigger machine, the bigger the machine you have, the faster you can do it with Skyline. Um, Okay, so who does everybody now have this thing fully imported? Uh, so let's let's expand this uh, th this first IRT thing. These are our IRTs. We can see that they all have three transitions. So we don't need a lot to detect our IRTs. We just need three transitions. So it's not the six transitions that we were talking about. Uh, Let's expand this next protein. I'm going to go ahead and, and close the um, I'm going to go ahead and close the auto log here. It's been nice, but uh, well, wow, look at some new things. Uh, so now if you select this first peptide, you know, you can see that this is not a real mass spectrometer spectrum, right? This is just the, uh, actually in Skylines, cut it off at 300 because that's all we were allowing, but we can we can uh, import it. But you can see everything in here, Skyline knows, has, has an explanation for every ion in here. You can see that there are more than six of them. Let's try expanding it. And, and Skyline has given, you know, all these things a rank and uh, you can see that some of them are water losses. If you hover over the ion sky, will give you the explanation that this is, you know, this is the B4 with a water loss, and this is the B5 with a water loss, and you know, uh, and we've got yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> I guess you have to l just learn them. Yeah, sorry, there aren't that many of them to learn. But yeah, we, we, we should probably have a little tip thing. That, that's a good idea. But, but yeah, so this little clock face means it's an IRT. So when you see, when you see that little clock face next to a, a peptide, you, you're happy because, okay, Skyline knows that it's an IRT standard. And these little scratch marks means, means that there is a spectrum. 
Okay, so now to do our statistics, we would actually like to have just six transitions because we'll have the most we'll have the most stable statistics if we have the same number of transitions in every in every run. And that's the way the Navarro paper was done. So we're going to go ahead and do that here. Right now we have 240,000 transitions, but one, we're going to do a quick refinement and get down to six for every, not six total, but <laughs> six for everything. Okay, so go edit, refine, advanced, and the minimum peptides per protein, uh, we're going to say six. Oh no, not, forget it. No, no, don't do that. Uh, we're going to say six here, uh, minimum transitions per precursor, and we're going to go ahead and say, you know, auto pick all the transitions. I'm not, I don't think we need to do that, but it's in my script, so I'm going to stick to it uh, and click OK. And that takes a few seconds, but Scott is not responding. While it works on this. Yeah, it's uh, this is this is a this is a hard op operation. And frequently when we have a hard operation, we try to we try to show some progress, but I guess we didn't hear. Wow, that's longer than I expected. Up. Went up? I don't think that's possible. No. Really? <laughs> that, so that's the problem? We're going up? Uh, yeah, that's okay. I'm going I'm going back on my uh yeah, whoops. I changed something about my steps, see? I hadn't I hadn't quite thought this through. Did somebody, okay, I'm done too. So, so the problem is, oh, it went up a little bit. So the problem is that I went with, uh, yeah, I actually wanted to, this will take a long time too. All right, so if I go to, uh, if I go to transition settings, I think this is, uh oh, man. <laughs> Uh, I actually want to go to my library and say, let's just take six transitions and click OK. And now this is going to take a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So at least we have progress, though. Anybody have any questions at this point? So, um, yeah, so that's Windows command line batch. Uh, you could use PowerShell or you, know, you could use any, any, any of the shell languages. Yeah, yeah, if you want, I mean, if you can get a bash for Windows, you can, you can write it in bash. Uh, we do have, we recently have published a Linux version of Skyline command line. So you can run Skyline command line on Linux and we're starting to design, we're, doing, we're trying to, we have them running. We haven't published or, or made them public yet, hope, hoping, I know, looking pretty dicey to get it done by ASMS, but that was the original goal. Uh, um, but we're going to have Panorama run a pipeline at Amazon Web Services uh, on the Linux servers there. So that seems to be working. Okay, so now I'm done. I have what I expected. I've got 175,000 transitions. Does everybody have that? All right. So, and... Uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of a roundabout way to get there, but that's what we have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So actually, yeah. So the IRTs, yeah, they they their their libraries they only have three things, uh, and it used to be that one of the refinement we did where we said we only want things with six six transitions would have blown away our IRTs. Until I until I finally put it in there, they're like, okay, those refinements don't apply to anything that's marked as a standard. So if you have an IRT standard or a global normalization standard or some other type of standard, we'll leave it alone no matter what it looks like. 
So that's, so yeah, it, it, uh, about a year or two ago, if I had done that operation, all my IRTs would have disappeared and I would have had to put them back in the document. So the last thing we want to do before we could run this, we can either manually import the data or run the script is to add decoys. So edit, refine, uh, add decoy peptides. And by the way, the latest version of Skyline puts all this refine stuff on a top level menu. So you don't have to go into the edit menu anymore. You just go refine, add decode peptides. Uh, okay, and so Skyline says, yeah, let's do the same number. It's not necessary to do equal numbers. It's not like decoy counting. So if I have really, really massive, like if I'm working with the pan human library, I may actually only use like one quarter to one eighth as many decoys as, 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 my, as my targets. You don't have to do 50-50. 50-50 works really well, but the statistics work, work out without 50-50. So we'll just click OK to this, shuffle sequence, equal numbers, and Skyline will really pretty quickly, I hope, add that to the bottom. And now we have 347,000 transitions. You can see that at the bottom. Uh, save this file. What? So you maybe so you maybe have to go back again and go edit, refine, uh, and then advance, and then you have to go pick all transitions. You have to make sure this is checked. So if you if you force Skyline to repick all the transitions, it might take a little time, but it will, and you should have the same number as we have. Okay, so this is this is a this is it. That's the template method. You can now go run the script or you can import files. Um, so we're we're kind of out of time for tonight. Uh, but uh, do people have a little extra time? I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> are, do, are people ready to run out? Because uh, the one thing you can do either here or at home uh, is you can go import results and, and then just go into this one raw file that we got the isolation scheme out of and you can open that. And then Skyline will start its import. Um, yeah, so Skyline will start importing that one file on my laptop. It'll take, I don't know, it might take five to 10 minutes. What? In the import window, you, you go to the raw one, you go to here, raw one, and then choose this one raw file. <laughs> So you file, import results, click OK, and then choose this one raw file, and that will get it started. And we're not going to try to, we, you don't even have all 24, we're not going to try to import all 24, um, but you could. You can at least import one. And don't get too excited, this, this first pass is just finding out where the IRT peptides are, so you're not actually 50% done. This is, this is how far done you are. Uh, but you can see, you should be feeling, oh, hey, it's finally the IRT peptides, yay. And you'll, you'll even, these colors are determined by the peptide sequence, so they're going to be consistent. So if you use a consistent set of standards, you'll get this warm, fuzzy feeling every time you see that to show up across the screen here. Uh, and you'll know that, that, that your data is working out. Um, and then, now, and then now it's good. Once it's done with that, then we'll make another pass. And so it's, it's, it's extracting full gradient chromatograms for these. And then it's going to extract much narrower uh, chromatograms for all the peptides. And we'll look at that tomorrow. Uh, and we'll look at it by opening a file that's all processed. So even if you don't go, even if you don't do this right now or go home right now and start importing data, uh, we will just start from a new file tomorrow. Yes. Multiple raw files. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you create, say, multiple injections, 
Because right now we're just moving one. Yeah, you would just go choose a bunch. You, I mean, it's, it's very easy. You, you, would just, you just select them all. So when you go file import, you go into a folder and there'd be 24 files. You select them all and click import. Just like you did for the tutorial, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, so most of the time with DIA, it's going to be single injection replicates, meaning that, that single injection replicates just means that it only took me one injection to measure everything. And so that's really important for SRM, because SRM and PRM, you might actually use multiple injections to measure everything. For DIA, you usually just use one injection. So it's gonna, you're just going to take that default every time. Um, and then depending on how much memory you have and how, uh, how much processing power you have, you, you can choose to, to import many at a time or, you know, so I, I'm importing one at a time. I'm only importing one. Uh, but yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Well, you can you hold down the control key and then you click and drag to pan. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no unfortunately there's no like left arrow, right arrow, or yeah, like that doesn't. So you have to use your mouse to pan. Uh, and if you want to zoom in and out, you can use your scroll wheel. Uh, or you can use two-finger dragging. Anything that's a scrolling action will, will cause it to go. Um, but yeah, so we'll look more at the data uh, tomorrow once, once we're back here, have some more time. Um, so we're not done, we're not done with the Bruder data set. Um, we'll go ahead and open it. I'll also show you. So we started with an assay library. We could have just built our own our own library and started with that. Uh, and I'll show you how I I'll show you the max quant results and how I would build a library from the max quant results as well. So, all right.